Archibald <laughs> sitting online waiting for us saying thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everybody. Hopefully you were able to grab a little bit of sustenance. Um, so I just, uh, I, I wanted to go ahead and introduce our next presentation. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce the Honorable Justice Todd Archibald, who joins us today to present on the topic of the art of science of persuasion. And he will be joined by Richard Halpern for an engaging discussion. Honorable Justice Todd uh, Archibald is president of Archibald Mediation and Arbitration Solutions and was appointed Justice of the Superior Court of Justice from 1999 to 2021. And I'm also proud to uh, mention that uh, Justice Archibald has a new publication uh, that has just come out. It is called Litigation and Administrative Advocacy, The Art and Science of Persuasion. And we will make sure that we provide that information to all of our attendees after the conference so that you can check out um, that publication. And so without further ado, over to you. Thanks very much, Brenda. And I think Richard is there too. I'm here. Um, can I, everybody hear me at this point? We hear you. Terrific. So I'm down in Florida. This is our anniversary week. And to join our playing golf, otherwise I'd be there in person. And I'm very pleased to be with you today, especially because my spouse is a much better golfer and that can be very aggravating on most days. So it's a delight to be here and I've been able to uh, attend a bit of the conference today. And I know one of the titles is Risky Business. And for sure, after you've gotten through this conference, it's no longer a risk whatsoever, but it's a safe harbor. So my kudos and congratulations to all the presenters. And it's been a wonderful conference, taking a lot of preparation time and so many good nuggets for all of us in this room. Richard invited me on board about seven weeks ago, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I know Richard's made two presentations today, two marvelous presentations already. So my presentation is a simple one. It is the building blocks of persuasion. This particular um, slide deck that you see is part of an advanced trial advocacy course that I used to teach up at Wasgood. I call it Wasgood because they hired me, Wasgood, in the <laughs> LA course. And this is the first lecture of 12. So if after this lecture you like it, then perhaps you might like my book. If after this first lecture you go, boy, there was nothing in there of any interest, then please don't buy my book at all. Anyway, I just thought I'd let you know that for sure. I've been teaching um, advocacy since 1985 back in the old bar admissions course. And uh, the bar admissions course doesn't exist anymore. And I've been a student of advocacy for the last, oh my gosh, 45 years. And I love it. it's exciting and it's really important. So for everybody in the audience, whether you're a barrister, whether you're a solicitor, whether you're an expert, whether you're a law clerk, persuasion is what we do as a living. Whether you appear before a tribunal, whether you appear before a courtroom, whether you're in a boardroom, whether you're an expert. Persuasion is what we do for a living. And you really need to have the building blocks of persuasion. They're all simple building blocks, but at your fingertips always when you think about it. So the first slide before we play it is a, a presentation. He used to be my favorite actor, and for reasons that are obvious when you see who it is, he's no longer. It's Clarence, he's playing Clarence Darrell, and it's a minute and a half closing address in the Leopold and Loeb murders in 1925. Leopold and Loeb were these two wealthy jerks from New York City that went down to Tennessee and they killed an innocent third party stranger just for kicks. But Loeb, fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, left his glasses at the scene. Loeb glasses, you all heard of those, L-O-B-E-B, L-O-E-B. He was, of course, caught because of that, and they were both convicted, and the jury was deciding whether or not to have them hanged or not. Darrell, Clarence Darrell, one of our greatest advocates of all time, of course, argued vigorously and successfully in Tennessee, of all places, in 1925 against capital punishment. And when you hear his presentation for a minute and 20 seconds, it sums up the entire art of persuasion. Damien, if you might, please. Your Honor, I have stood here for three months as one might stand at the ocean trying to sweep back the tide. I have heard in the last few weeks nothing but a cry for blood. 
I never saw such enthusiasm for the death penalty as I've seen here. It's been discussed as a holiday, like a day at the races. I've heard words from the state's attorney that would shame a savage. Mr. Crow suggests that if we hang these boys, there will be less killing. This world has been one long slaughterhouse from its beginning until today, and I have no doubt the killing will go on forever. Would hanging them make mankind better or worse? Would it make the human heart softer, or would it make it harder? If the state in which I live is not kinder, more humane, more intelligent than the mad act of these two boys, I am sorry I have lived so long. That's a remarkable, short, concise, clear, evocative opening, or I should say closing statement. And it pretty much captures the lion's share of the points that I wish to put before you in terms of persuasion. One, conviction. Two, look at that evocative language that was used by Clarence Darrow. Three, credibility. He truly believed it. Four, concision. Not overloading the audience with too many words and too much nonsense. Controlling issue. You know what the controlling issue was there, clearly, about why capital punishment is so atrocious. And of course, to do that, minute and a half closing address took hours of preparation, which is a key critical component to any art of persuasion. The first slide is from J.J. Robinette. Most of you probably won't not remember him. I actually had the privilege of meeting him once. He was the greatest criminal and civil litigator in our country up to 1965, and he was at McCarthy's. And this is what he says, and this gives us all hope that we can be great advocates, because advocacy really is a science and not an art. You win by preparation and drudgery. You do research and you read. The actual appearance in court is often like the tip of an iceberg. Voila, what, what we just saw with Clarence Darrow. You try to be succinct. You formulate your argument as concisely yet as effectively as possible, getting down to the point of the case, avoiding red herrings. Sometimes, it means weeks of preparation. And that's exactly the point. The more you prepare, the more you think about the issues, the more you synthesize the good facts and the bad facts, the stronger of an advocate you will be. Next slide, Damien, please. And the really important point about preparation is this, you avoid this. If you don't know where you're going, when you get there, you're sure to be lost. And that's the great catcher, Yogi Bear of the Yankees. And we saw how this applies to the Leafs on Monday night against Chicago. <laughs> Typical, no plan. Next slide, please. So when you sit down months before your case and certainly months before your trial, you've got to think about what is the central theme of your case. What's the controlling issue the jury, judge, tribunal will want to address. Every trial is a persuasive three-dimensional tale, but it involves the true synthesization of the good and bad facts. Most lawyers run away from their bad facts. I would submit to all of you, you take those bad facts, put them up in a big poster right at the front of the courtroom so everybody can see. And you're all going to think that's completely nutty, but it works effectively. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Any of us can deal with our good facts. It's the warts that's hard to deal with. And you got to spend time thinking about how to attenuate, how to mitigate, how to soften them. Next slide, please. I'll give you an example. Back in the 60s and 70s, um, Edson Haynes was a defense insurance counsel. He did tons of medical malpractice. He did lots of, of uh, product liability cases. And in terms of this particular case, this is where a, a child was paralyzed and had broken his neck while, while diving into the shallow end of a pool. And this is what 
Ian Binney said about Edson Haynes. Edson Haynes was an expert at getting the court to define the question in a way favorable to his position. In a product liability case, the defense not only developed the theory, but the ledge where the young child broke his neck was installed to protect waiters at the shallow end of the pool, but introduced the term safety ledge for the concrete protrusion that broke his neck. Next slide, please. Even the plaintiff's lawyer began re referring to the protrusion as a safety ledge. Once the question had been resolved into whether or not it was negligent to install a safety ledge, the insurance company was home free. Thus, the controlling issue. And most of us are old enough to recall O.J. Simpson, that both the criminal trial and the civil trial. In the criminal trial, the controlling issue became the bigoted and biased police. The issue of whether or not O.J. Simpson actually killed his spouse and his spouse's alleged lover became subordinate to the issue of the bigotry of the police. And that resulted in O.J.'s acquittal. About face in the civil trial, the plaintiff's counsel were able to persuade the jury, a jury too in the criminal case, that the controlling issue was really O.J. Simpson, his horrible temper and his controlling personality and his savagery. And that led to a verdict of around $500 million in favor of the plaintiffs, the estate of his ex-wife, now deceased, and her alleged lover. Next slide, please. So the controlling theme, ladies and gentlemen, justifies the morality of your theory and appeals to the justice of the case. It appeals to why you should win. Why should you win as opposed to your opponent? It is your foundation of persuasion, and it's a good theme, helps to attenuate your bad facts. Think about Clarence Darrow's closing address, which we heard moments ago, and how the controlling theme that Darrow used was incredibly evocative and powerful and led to, which was unheard of back in 1925, 12 jury men, because women weren't allowed on juries back then, which was ridiculous, but 1925, no surprise, to commuting those two young men sentenced to life imprisonment as opposed to death. Slide number nine. So integration of good facts and bad facts. You always got to think about the other side's case and how the other side's case interface interfaces with and conflicts with your case. Goldilocks, we all know that case of the three bears and Goldilocks was out in the woods and she was starving and she was out for three or four days and lost and she came upon the three bears house and she broke into it and she started eating and drinking and uh, but as she did so because she was starving she wrecked the house. So she was charged with trespass. Her defense would have been necessity. I had to break in that house because if I didn't I wouldn't have survived. Next slide, please. The likely result, though, would have been she would have been found guilty because the bad facts of her wrecking the house ridiculously would have trumped the theory of her having to do so because of necessity, because of starvation. Aristotle, 2,000 years, talked about controlling themes. So anything I write about, I stole from somebody else over 2,000 years because the building blocks of persuasion have been there forever in the English Commonwealth and even in the Greek Commonwealth in the Roman situations. And the pillars are based upon logic. Is your story logical? Ethics. Is it ethical? Is it credible? Have you dealt with the bad facts appropriately? And lastly, emotion. Does it ring? Does it catch the heart or the brain of the jury? And so you always want to think about your case from the lens of logic, ethics, and emotion. And you've got to capture all three pillars to make a three-dimensional story evocative. Next slide, please. Now, this is critical. It's trite, but critical. Jerry Spence was a great criminal lawyer in the U.S., not one of my favorites, but he wrote several texts on advocacy. 
and I agree with him on this. One can stand as the greatest orator the world has known, possess the quickest mind, employ the cleverest psychology, and have mastered all the technical devices of argument. But if one is not credible, one might just as well preach to the publicans. So as an expert and as a lawyer, it's critical that you never overstate. It's critical that you always admit, concede when there are other options. You never come on aggressively, assertively, over the top. Understatement, concession, courtesy, professionalism are all central components of you selling, because we're all word salespeople, whether as experts or lawyers, we're selling words. But our words will not be listened to, will not be heard, will be used car salesmen if we're not credible. So remember this, please. Never, ever overstate. And if a judge asks you or a tribunal member asks you a tough question that you can't answer, just say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, or Mr. X, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. Don't equivocate no matter what, because equivocation in this case will lead to that particular tribunal member, that judge thinking, I can't trust that individual. I can't trust that lawyer. Once you've lost trust, once you've lost respect, it's over. No matter how persuasive you might be, you become unpersuasive. So please never forget that. Very trite, but so critically important. Carry on, please. Next slide. Build on integrity and expertise, obviously. Expertise over the facts and the law. And Richard talked lots today about expert opinions. And when Richard would stand up in a court of law talking about experts, a judge can listen very carefully to him and to Duncan, for example, as two good examples. Integrity, prepared, honest, no overstatement, no embellishment. Demonstrated expertise over the subject matter. Courtesy. Your reputation is hard to win and easily lost. If you're unprepared, if you're sloppy, if you cut corners, you will lose your reputation in your first case or in your second case, and regrettably, it's a stain, much like a tattoo, that you can't get off your arm. Don't ever lose your credibility. Next slide, please. Buckley's cough syrup, they've changed their model recently, but it was great. Um, it tastes awful, but it works. Own up to your bad facts. Concede your bad facts. You know, if your bad facts swamp your good facts, then what the heck are you doing in court? Settle the case at mediation. Get it settled, get it resolved. Don't be standing there in front of a judge where your bad facts are far more compelling than your good facts. Because what are you gonna say? Not a lot. And again, you get trapped then with your bad facts and then you start to overstate and you start to misstate. You always, as counsel and as an expert, and I mean this, you've got to maintain the high moral ground or the moral high ground and never give it up. Next slide, please. Okay, my least favorite president. Lyndon Johnson was president long before most of you uh, were on the face of the earth in the 60s. I didn't like him much because when I was playing football with my high school team in Cerny, Ontario, against the Port Huron, Michigan team, um, I had a lot of Port Huron, Michigan friends. And of course, the following year in 1967 or 68, they never showed up because they'd been shipped off, sadly, to the Vietnam War and never came back. Lyndon Johnson had this right about conviction. What convinces is conviction. You simply have to believe in the argument you are advancing. If you don't, you're as good as dead. The other person will sense that something isn't there. So you gotta believe, ladies and gentlemen, in what you're asserting. As an expert, you gotta believe in what you're asserting. If you're overstating, if you're making things up, if you're exaggerating, if you're stretching it, you're not gonna, you're gonna be giving it away. Your body language, as we're gonna hear in a few moments, will give it away. And the judge just isn't gonna accept it. So attenuate it, contour it down. Don't try to go for a home run when a triple will do. And even a single often is very persuasive. I use that metaphor because of course we're into the baseball time and of course our Jays let us down again. Next slide. <laughs> okay, conviction. 
We sell words, experts, solicitors, barristers, whether they appear before tribunals, settlement conferences, before mediators, you're selling your case based upon words. Your tone, your pace, your posture matter. And we'll see about that in a minute with one of the slides. Rapid fire delivery, never, because it's not persuasive. Let's play that. Nope, we've got to play the little video. I think the video was back there, one right there. Okay, you just travel plans. I need to be in New York on Monday, LA on Tuesday, New York on Wednesday, LA on Thursday, New York on Friday. Got it? You got it. Got it. So you want to work here? What really makes you think you deserve a job here? Well, sir, I think on my feet I'm going to figure to have a sharp mind. Excellent. Can you start on Monday? Yes, sir, absolutely, without hesitation. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And in conclusion, Jim, Bill, Bob, Call, Fred, Low, Dork, Ape, and Ted. Business is business. And as we all know, in order to get something done, you got to do something. In order to do something, we got to get to work. So let's get to work. Thank you for taking me here. Okay. So that was funny, but not persuasive. So, when you're in court, as a be in a mediation, take a breath, slow it down. If you're well prepared, you have your life jacket because you've written out most of the key points. You have thought about them and you have played them back in your head before you attend court, before the tribunal. And that's your safety jacket that will allow you to be persuasive. People that speak quickly or do this, ah. Uh, uh, are not persuasive. And the reason why you do, ah, uh, you're thinking about it extemporaneously as opposed to thinking about it in advance. If you've given forethought to it, the ums and the ahs will disappear. So speak slow enough to let people follow, but quick enough to engage eye contact. One of the critical things about advocacy is talk to your audience. Don't read to your audience. Look at your audience. Now, I can't see many of you today because I'm 1,500 miles away, but I'm attempting to look at the screen so that I'm attempting to make eye contact with my invisible audience today so you get the point. That's really critically important. And the other reason for that is if you're watching the trier of fact, jury, judge, tribunal, guess what? You're picking up cues all the time as to one, whether they are hearing what you're saying, one whether they're absorbing what you're saying, two, and three, whether they're agreeing with what you're saying. That's why it is of key importance that you're always watching your audience because to persuade involves knowing what you're selling and whether it's being absorbed by your audience. Okay, let's carry on to the next one, please. One of our greatest Shakespearean actors, and me, hopefully some of you had the privilege of seeing him this summer um, King, in King Lear up at Stratford, he makes this great point, and it's true. Get out of your own way through preparation. If you prepare, you're no longer caught up in being taught Archibald or being combed fear. You become King Lear. You become Clarence Darrell because you know the material so well that you're no longer worried about you. You're no longer t intimidated by your audience. You're no longer fearful by your lack of preparation, but you come in there with great confidence. And that's of critical importance. Next slide, please. So take this to heart. You may disagree with the statistics but the statistics are shocking. So whether they're accurate within 5% or 10%, they're still very, very valuable and educational for all of us. The impact of word selection, 53%. Body language, shockingly, 32%. Yikes, stripes. The way you stand, what you wear, how you look at your audience, is all impactful in terms of persuasion. The tone that you use, measured, aggressive, soft, harsh, is 15%. So even if it's only 5% and not 15%, my gosh, you've got to be alive to this. And if you're not alive to this, these components, you're not doing your clients the service that you need in terms of persuasion. Now, I think that's the jump off point for Richard to step in, I believe. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Um, can you hear me okay, Todd? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I can. Great. So I just wanted to weave uh, what uh, Justice Archibald has said into 
everything else that we do in preparing a case, not just trial. My mentor always told me, uh, you prepare for war to make the best peace. It's always better to settle a case, and we don't get to try as many cases these days as we used to try. It takes longer, they're more complicated. But everything that Justice Archibald has said about preparation is consistent with the theme of my earlier talks and what Duncan had to say about preparing your case. And uh, I'm not going to focus on the slides that I've done because they're sort of a bit of a rep repetition to what I said before, but just the delivery that, that uh, you were just talking about, I think it's important when we do examinations for discovery, I continue to try to persuade people that that's where you win your case. And I think that the way that you ask questions, that you participate in the discovery, uh, the rhythm that you get when you're, you're doing the discovery, uh, way, the way not to get flustered is to do the preparation and know your case. And by knowing your case, you can then formulate the questions. You should not have a script. If you know your case, you don't need a script. I always prepare a script, but I never take it out. I never use it. So don't have a script, whether you're at trial or you're at discovery, don't have a script because you want to hear what the witness is saying. You want to respond to what the witness is saying. You want to follow up on the openings that the witness gives you to solidify your case and get the admissions that you need. So the only thing I wanted to add to this presentation is the drudgery of trial preparation that uh, Justice Archibald has talked about is the same drudgery and attention to detail that you need from the time that the case walks into the office to examinations, to discovery, to pretrial, and to trial. And all of these messages that we're getting now, I think, apply throughout the case. So I think I'll leave it at that and let you carry on. If you'll jump forward a few slides. Sure. Thanks very much, Richard. And many of you I've seen in my former life as a judge on medical malpractice uh, pretrials. Um, I've done lots of medical malpractice pretrials where I've seen Richard and Duncan, for example, and many of the others in the room, and litigation, settle, litigation, guardian settlements. I was listening to that conversation this morning, the 11 o'clock presentation, and uh, it brought back memories of all the rule sevens I had to deal with over the years, and they were a, a tsunami of them. <laughs> so reliable narrator, which is really all of the building blocks that we discussed. You are the narrator. You're the stage manager of the presentation. Whether, again, it's a settlement, mediation, or whether it's a tribunal presentation or a trial, you are setting the stage for what occurs and how it occurs. And as a reliable narrator, Preparation, as Richard has referred to today, and that's when one of the common themes of today's seminar has been the importance of preparation in these complex cases, because you've got to make them as simple as possible for the individuals that you appear before who haven't had one-tenth the background that you have in terms of being judges. And the judges don't have the background that you have, is my point, and that's why you've got to simplify that. And juries, heaven forbid, don't have any of that. And you really have to tone it down so they get the point. So preparation is absolutely essential to take the complex and make it simple. Credibility I've referred to. Conviction I've referred to. Integrity, seizing the high moral ground and staying there. Professionalism. People forget this. Too often in court, I saw too many lawyers getting angry, getting upset, getting sharp, getting short. None of that is ever effective. In fact, my very, very best advice on that point is don't get mad. You get even by winning the case, but don't get provoked. Because if you get provoked and you start losing your cool, all you've done is allow the other side to take advantage of you. Because now you're into a level of emotion and subjectivity and lack of reason, and heaven forbid what comes out of your mouth, and often it's infantile nonsense. And if it's in front of a jury, the jury's just sitting there going, who the heck is this fellow? Or counsel, or woman. And the judge is doing the same thing. So, seize that high moral ground, regardless of provocation, regardless, and I mean it, and stay there. So your opponent, who's the bully, 
who's rude. Let him be the bully and rude, because bullies rarely win, and rudeness never wins out. And when you object, stand up calmly, patiently, and quietly and say, Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt my friend, but I have a serious matter that I wish to draw to your attention. Even if you provoked, sit on your hands when you do that. So it comes out like that. That's professionalism and that's professional courtesy. Even the worst opponent, if he's wearing a gown, deserves your courtesy. Experience, judgment are all factors in terms of being a reliable narrator. All right? Next slide, please. This is a critical one, simplification. If you don't prepare, you always have a long-winded factum, a long-winded mediation brief. You know, these days, I have the privilege of having very good lawyers in front of me on mediations, but I still get mediation briefs that are about 40 pages too long. In other words, lawyers need to have the courage of their convictions to atrophy their mediation briefs and their factums for the Court of Appeal to 10 pages, 15 pages, 20 pages, because you drown the audience in a sea of words and your best points get lost in that sea of words. John Sapinka, my favorite judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, was a superb civil litigator. He died, my gosh, more than 20 years ago. He was also a superb athlete. He was 20 years my senior. I played tennis with him regularly, and I never beat him once. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's why I practice being a lawyer as opposed to a golfer or a tennis player, because I'm not much of an athlete. He said this, multiplicity of arguments hints at a lack of faith and confidence in your major grounds of appeal and may dilute or weaken a good case and not save a bad one. Less is always more. The two main culprits, ladies and gentlemen, of concision and focus is too little time and fear that if you cut an argument that, my gosh, what one will my client think, or maybe that argument's the best one. You've really got to think, if you're not going to win in your first argument, you're not likely to win on your second argument, and you're not likely to win on your third argument, and I guarantee you, you're not going to win in your tenth argument, and your tenth argument's going to swamp your best one, because the judge, the tribunal, will be so irritated with you, enough with you, is what they will be thinking. Next slide, please. Less is always more. Dilution is never the solution. Have courage to go with your best arguments. Do not overtax your audience with words and drown them in a sea. When you choose fewer words, you reduce the risk that the trier of fact will filter out the good points that, that you have and will forget about the good points. Now, we're going to play another slide in a moment, and this is a closing address from the show Law and & Order, and the defense in this case was based upon drunkenness through drugs. Now, one of the one of the key things of this very concise closing address, which is marvelous, it's like a minute, is the use of demonstrative evidence. That is usually lesson number four in most advocacy courses, lesson number four or five. We're not going to deal with demonstrative evidence, but you're going to get the point when you see this closing address. If we can play that, please. No sound on that. That's a lot of pills, isn't it? Can we can we uh, precisely go? the amount that Gregory Loomis took over his two years? Let's just play it one more time, right from the beginning, because you hear all the pills going into the, and that's of critical importance symbolically for the motif of the prosecutor. Please. We were able to hear it here. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's play it. Let's, let's carry on. Oh, Sorry. Okay. That's a lot of pills, isn't it? Precisely the amount that Gregory Loomis took over his two years on Sentinel. It was supposed to help him study and achieve his full potential. 
But what he didn't know, and what his parents didn't know, and what the doctor didn't know, was that every one of these pills could be as lethal as a bullet. No one knew because the manufacturing drug company never told anyone about possible side effects of suicide or murder. Tragically, one of these bullets went off and killed Alex Garcia. Now that's, you know, an over-the-top closing, which wouldn't be allowed in Canada and America, anything goes. But the point still remains of how effective it was with the use of demonstrative evidence. I mean, that was incredible. And the concision and the focus. It was spellbinding. The language was spellbinding and incredibly persuasive. Blaise Pascal in 1656 said the following. It's been wrongly attributed to Mark Twain. This is what Blaise Pascal said to his son. It's in French, but the English translation is, I did not have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. And that captures it perfectly. Don't suffocate the listener with too many words. Concision and focus, brevity is the soul of wit and the soul of persuasion. Next slide, please. Yeah, we can go on to the next one because I just said that. There we go. One more, please. Thank you. Justice John Arnup sat on the Court of Appeal for many years. He was a terrific scholar from Weir Folds. I had the privilege of appearing before him, and he was a tough, no-nonsense judge. One of the points when he taught advocacy, he said, short sentences make for crisp writing and cogent oral argument. And that's very true, too. We get carried away in our factums with these long-winded 60-word sentences go on and on and on, and the thought gets lost completely in the myriad of the words in the who knows which way we're going direction of the sentence. So you've got to look at what you write, you've got to look at what you say, and say it in small sound bites and write it in small sound bites in one syllable words. One syllable words are your best friend and your best persuasive advocate. Next please. Okay, use of persuasive language and use of repetition. Use of persuasive language when you speak, when you write. Expert writes his report. Settlement conferences, settlement briefs, factums, all of that is critical. The use of language, oral or written. I've written on this in my text. I am persuaded that written words and oral persuasion are identical. There's no difference in substance between what you write and what you say. They both should take an equal amount of time in terms of preparation. Just look at what Winston Churchill said. Winston Churchill, I was a big fan of his. I wasn't born when he was around. I'm a big fan of his cigars for sure, and I'm a big fan of his evocative language. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. My God, right away you listen to that, you got the point, it's evocative, it's persuasive, it's unique. Emphasis, emphasis is effective, resonating, wordsmithing is important. It's lyrical, it's poetic, it resonates, it's memorable. Next slide, please. Caesar, I came, I saw, I conquered. You're never going to forget that. Eloquent turn of phrase through parallel structure, memorable and persuasive. Next slide. This is from Justice John Laskin, who was my mentor, and he taught for many, many years the art of written advocacy, and he would say that it equally applies, as I do, to oral advocacy. Never use three-syllable words when a one-syllable word will do. Plain, concrete language, no Latin. In fact, lawyers and law students love Latin. Get rid of it all. Just never use another Latin word except for maybe semper, ubi, sub, ubi, which I learned in grade 12, which means always wear underwear. But otherwise, every Latin phrase, get rid of it. Romance, the active verb. We lawyers talk in passive past tense. Get rid of it. Romance, the affirmative active verb. verb. Avoid excessive use of adjectives. Adjectives are useless. And adverbs. They really, the word very is not helpful. Truly is not helpful. 
That's for the trier of fact to decide whether you're truly effective. You're either effective or you're not. And being truly effective is just an oxymoron. Do not say she felt sad, for example, when you can say she had tears streaming down her face. Show, don't tell. She had tears streaming down her face. That's way more evocative than she was sad. She felt sad. Another classic example, one more we put up. Next slide, please. Is Stephen Stark used the Holmes Holmes on the Supreme Court of the United States in 1925. In fact, he heard the Leopold and Loeb appeal. Free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. Boy, oh boy, you get the point. It's crisp, it's beautiful, it's evocative, and it's persuasive, and it's painted a picture with words. Make the triers see, hear, and feel what you're talking about. Next slide. Professor, uh, Professor, President Zelensky has many better phrases than this one. This one I picked up a year ago, but because he loves repetitive language. He said, read my lips without gas. This was, he was talking about Russia. Without gas or without you. Without you. Without light or without you. Without you. He's one of the best orators of the 21st century from the Ukraine. Repetition is poignant and memorable. Next slide. Organization. Now another bullet point. This is the ninth one. Organization. Once you prepare, you got to think about what you want to emphasize, and you got to put things in order, whether in your factum, whether in your mediation brief, whether in your closing or opening statements, in your examination in chief, in your cross-examination. One of the key points in a trite point is we retain what is first and said last. What is said first and said last. Cognitive psychologists tell us that we absorb information better when we know why it's relevant. We are more likely to absorb and retain what you say first and last. So don't waste the beginnings and endings of your opening or closing statements or your examination in chief or closing or your cross-examinations. Lawyers all the time have this incredible buildup in examination in chief. I'm going to submit to you respectfully, you've got to redo it. Cross-examination especially, you spend 10 minutes getting to the dance. Let's get to the dance much faster, because when you do so, when you get to the dance, the trier of fact, judge, or juries long stop listening to you. Very true. Begin by showing why you should win or why your position is stronger, not why the other side should lose. Next slide, please. Just repeats the same primacy. What is heard first has a special claim to acceptance. Next slide. Recency. What is heard last is more easily remembered. I'm trying to go a little bit faster, ladies and gentlemen, because I know you're behind time. So I'm trying to get you back at least five minutes if I can from the presentation here. Next slide, please. So point first advocacy, or it's known now as context first advocacy, this was developed by Professor Ed Berry, who was an English professor, now retired from the University of Alabama, and he was a brilliant man, and I never liked his football team and still don't, and Justice John Laskin, who became a student of Professor Ed Berry, and John imported Ed's position in the English language and writing novels into writing factums and opening and closing statements. And the key is to announce at the outset the conclusions that you wish to be reached by the trier of fact. So it's point first advocacy. Readers absorb information best if they understand its significance as soon as they hear it, as opposed to a mystery novel where you go all the way through and then reveal the outcome at the very beginning. John Laskin would say you do it in reverse. You tell the conclusion in your first page and then you build back from that. And I entirely agree with that. Next slide, please. Advocates should never leave an audience guessing, why the heck are you telling me this? What relevance does that have to do with anything? I don't get it. As soon as the trier of facts starts to do that in their head, they stop listening. 
or worse, they start creating their own conclusions. Remember, you're the stage manager. You're the reliable narrator, whether you're the expert or counsel. It is up to you to control the stage, not to have the stage taken away from you. Headlines, lists, keep the listener on track. And that's whether it's oral communication. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm turning to my second point. As I mentioned to you 10 minutes ago, when I briefly outlined the five points that I wish to cover, point number two is timing. My client was not there when the police assert that he was. And then you go on from there. That's a headline, and that's going back and reemphasizing what you already told the trier of fact. It's incredible cognitively. Even though it's an opening or a closing or a settlement brief or a factum, if you tell your audience on the first page what you're going to prove, and then on the fifth page you come back to that very same point, they go, oh, they've just proved it, even though you haven't, because you're just wordsmithing. But the organization of that wordsmithing is incredibly persuasive. Roadmap, the principle of context before argument and details. The value of continuous headlines and introductions. Leave the mystery for the movies and not for your first page of your factum. In all mediation briefs, the first page should tell the mediator what you want to accomplish. How often do I see that? Many times. Factums. How many times do I see a factum where the first page tells me what the, what the lawyers want? Maybe 5% or 10% of the time. So I'm asking you to rejig, recalibrate, rethink. You can say, Archibald's full of nonsense. I'm not going to do it that way. I perfectly respect that. All I'm submitting to you is these are tried and true principles from my perspective. Some you may agree with, some you may disagree with, but hopefully you will agree with more than what you disagree with. Next point, please. And it's four o'clock. Okay, every, and again, because I'm being your bus driver today in terms of this, your stage manager, reliable narrator, I've been mindful of the time because now I should have finished if we've been exactly on time. So I'm gonna try to finish in the next five minutes to have you regain some of the time you lost. Every judge, every tribunal is a juror at heart. We wanna do the right thing. We wanna arrive at the just outcome for the parties. Always trade places with the trier of fact when you prepare your case. Anticipate what's gonna trouble them, what they're not gonna like. Address and assess your bad facts and lead with your chin with those bad facts because if you don't, the jury's not going to think you're reliable. If you lead with these bad facts, the jury, the trier of fact, the judge is going to love you. They're going to adore you because they're going to say, that's a lawyer that I trust, we're going to respect, and can believe in. And if I can believe in him or her, I can believe in his or her client. That is so important. Last slide, I think. Are we there? Last slide. I come back to where I started. It's like an opening or a closing address where you tell the jury what you're going to prove, then you prove it, and you're closing and you say, and by the way, six weeks ago, I told you this was the, the uh, roadmap that I was going to present to you, and I think I've been true to my word. I've taken you, ladies and gentlemen, from A to B, and we're now back to A, which was the point that I wanted to make from the very beginning six weeks ago and did so. Louis Neiser, who died about five years ago, a great, great criminal lawyer, said this, preparation is the be all of good trial work. Everything else, felicity of expression, improvisational brilliance, is a satellite around the sun. Thorough preparation is that sun. And that's what you've been learning all day long from your very gifted speakers in this marvelous seminar that's been presented today about the importance of preparation in complex medical malpractice cases. Thank you very much for inviting me on board. It's been a privilege and an honor to be here, and I wish I could have been there in person, but if I had, I would have gotten divorced, so I think I'm probably better off talking <laughs> Thank you, to you so much, Justice Archibald. Appreciate it. Golf Thank well. <laughs> Thank you.